525 have been introduced in 41 states, many of them specifically targeting our transgender youth. Some bills seek to ban gender-affirming care, while others are designed to dictate what sports kids can play or what bathrooms they can use. But all of them are part of the same concerted effort, exercising the power of government to target children. At the same time, leaders on the far right are promoting anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. During this year's Conservative Political Action Conference, one speaker was applauded when he declared, and I quote, transgenderism must be eradicated. We must reject this divisive and hateful rhetoric. And at this point, I'd like to remind our colleagues, our children are listening, and they are in danger. In fact, today, transgender youth are among the most at risk of homelessness, depression, and death by suicide. So when these young people who are already struggling hear politicians amplify hateful rhetoric that denies their very existence, what message does it send? We have a responsibility to support all of our children, no matter how they identify. This morning across America, families are meeting with doctors and being told they must make critical decisions, life and death decisions, about surgery and medical treatment for their children. These are personal and family moments which the parents will never forget. I know I've been there. But increasingly, state legislatures have decided that the decisions will be subject to regulation and criminal punishment by the government. You saw the video of the Missouri father. Does he sound like a radical who is trying, anxious to experiment with his child's future? Not to me. He sounds like a father who resisted acknowledging the real condition of his child until he realized he was wrong. I'm sure it was a painful, labored process and journey, but he is convinced he did the right thing for his transgender daughter. Regulating the age when a young person can buy a tattoo or drive a car is one thing, but making a decision that fundamental that could affect the life of an individual should be viewed differently. Brings me to another reminder. As member of this committee, we also have a responsibility to engage in civil discourse. While spirited debate is a sign of healthy democracy, we should not tolerate language that disparages anyone. I'd like to close by saying it's natural to be confused by what we don't know. Today, most Americans don't personally know anyone who identifies as trans. So my hope is that this hearing will be a chance to share the stories and reveal the truth, that, that like the rest of the LGBT community, transgender Americans are our neighbors, our colleagues, our fellow citizens. They have the same hopes and dreams that all of us share. LGBTQ Americans are asking for no more and no less than the full freedom to live who they are. With that, I'll hand over to Ranking Member Graham for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll certainly echo what you said about the way we conduct ourselves here. Uh, emotional topic, important topic to talk about. Uh, there's definitely two sides to every story, and there's definitely two sides to this story. You characterize those people who are concerned about minors having puberty blocking uh, drugs and surgery is far right. I don't think that's true. I think there are a lot of people in this country very much worried about where we're headed as a nation, particularly when it comes to young girls having to compete against biological males. Title IX was passed in 1972 uh, to ensure that women would have a place in college athletics uh, because most of them are non-revenue generating sports. Some generate revenue, most don't, but I think most athletic directors would say that it certainly makes the college experience better to uh, support women athletics at that level. It's a feeder program for our Olympic teams. There's been a lot of success, uh, the women's soccer program, and much of that came from the experience they had in college. This desire to level the playing field for women in 1972 was bipartisan. So now we have an assault, I think, on that concept. You mentioned eight years ago the Burgerfeld decision uh, created a constitutional right to same-sex marriage and legislation you talked about. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about other things here. Uh, the father who testified um, before the Missouri 
I, I guess it was one of the House or Senate, seemed very sincere. I don't question that at all. He was worried about something being taken away from his transgender daughter. That's a good concept to remember. Rights of one should be upheld and cherished, but there are limits to the rights of one group versus the other, one individual versus the other individual. Your rights have to be balanced against other people's rights. And here's where I come down on this. You'll never convince me that a biological male who swam three years on the men's team <clears throat> and transitioned for the senior year, that was fair. And Ms. Gaines will talk about that. This is going on all over the country. Young girls are working hard in their particular sports, and on occasion they're having to compete against a biological male who has decided to transition, and the evidence, I think, <clears throat> is pretty common sense based that there's an advantage. And at Olympic level, you have to take certain tests for tes testosterone and other, other tests you have to take to compete in women's sports because there's a disadvantage. And I believe this debate will go into the 2024 cycle. And the question before us, one of the questions is, is it okay for a state to ban transitions of a minor, and I think it is. I think the state has every interest in protecting minor children uh, and regarding a medical procedure that is life-altering, given the evidence we have about how these procedures work. I find it curious that in Europe, they're beginning to pause pump the brakes, and slow down uh, laws that would allow minors to be transitioned because the evidence is suggesting that it's probably not the best thing to do, and they're taking a cautionary note, which makes America the outlier. That's the title of this um, article behind me. So today we're going to hear both sides of the story. Uh, my Democratic friends, uh, if they could, would stop every state in the country from having laws regarding minors being transitioned. I think that's your position pretty much on your side. And uh, on our side, we believe the states have every right to do that. And in my state, they're actually going down that road. So as we celebrate <clears throat> the 1972 Title IX Act reaching 50 years, plus we live in a time where the whole concept of Title IX is very much at risk. We're not talking about equality in marriage here today. We're talking about what are the boundaries, if any, in American society when it comes to minor children, and what is fair to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. We have five witnesses today. I'll introduce the majority witness and ask Senator Graham to introduce his witnesses. Our first witness is Harley Walker. Ms. Walker is 16 years old from Auburn, Alabama. She's here with her dad. She has advocated for trans rights and the importance of access to gender affirming care in her home state and nationwide. We also have Dr. Jimena Lopez. Dr. Lopez is a pediatric endocrinologist at Children's Medical Center of Dallas, Texas and an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Pediatric Endocrinology Division at UT Southwestern. Our final witness is Kelly Robinson. Ms. Robinson, from Chicago, is the president of the Human Rights Campaign and the first black queer woman to lead the organization. Ranking Member Graham, would you introduce Mr. Sharp and Ms. Gaines? Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Uh, I'm Matt Sharp is Senior Counsel Director of the Center for Legislative Advocacy Alliance Defending Freedom in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the director of the Center for Legislative Advocacy and special counsel at the Alliance. In his role, Mr. Sharp focuses on state and local legisl leg legislative matters, providing legal analysis and testimony how proposed legislation would impact civil rights and constitutional freedom. He's advised governors, legislatures, and policy organization organizations on the importance of protecting First Amendment rights. He holds a JD from Vanderbilt University School of Law, 
Riley Gaines is spokesperson for the Independent Women's um, Voice in Tennessee. Ms. Gaines um, defends single-sex uh, spaces for women, advocates for equality, stands up for women's safety and opportunities. Ms. Gaines is a former 12-time All-American swimmer from the University of Kentucky, has been a powerful voice speaking out against biological males participating in women's sports. Mr. Gaines, Ms. Gaines has challenged the roles of various sports leagues and travels to raise awareness about the need to protect women's spaces and encourage other female athletes to join her cause. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Graham. Here's what we'll do this morning. We'll uh, first swear in the witnesses, then we'll allow each of them five minutes for an opening statement, then members of the committee will be allowed to ask five-minute rounds uh, questions of the witnesses. So I'll ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. You affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got. Let the record reflect that all witnesses have answered in the affirmative, and so we can proceed, and we'll start with Harley Walker. Ms. Walker, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, my name is Harley Walker. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm 16 years old from Alabama. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to tell you more about myself and what it's like to be a trans person. I'm hoping to share what my journey has been like and to clear up some of the false information that I've heard coming out of Congress and state legislatures, including the Alabama State Legislature. Um, there has been so much misinformation shared around what it means to be a transgender person and what health care looks like for trans youth. Most of what I've been hearing is inaccurate at best or just outright falsehoods misrepresenting the steps and care taken by qualified medical professionals. Growing up, I had a really great childhood, a loving family and friends. As I grew, I just felt like something was different for me. Between 10 and 11, I told my parents that I believed I was transgender. Nobody pushed me to become transgender. No one suggested, forced, or influenced me to choose to be trans because it is not a choice. I knew that this was who I was. After I came out, my parents were doing the absolute best they could to support me, uh, took me to our local pediatrician. He sat down with us and referred us to medical professionals in our state that could best treat me. He never once pushed an agenda onto me. Instead, he listened, to the he listened to me, his patient, and advised all of us on how I could get the best health care for my situation. The team of specialists that he referred us to were incredible. They focused on getting to know me, understanding my specific case, getting to know my parents, and figuring out how to best care for me as a patient. They advised us at no point would they talk about surgeries on a minor. It wasn't even something that they would discuss. They never pushed any agenda. And instead, one of the things that stuck out to me and my parents was that if I ever decided to stop or change my mind, that it was okay, and they would support me no matter what. This is the opposite of what I hear in the news and in the legislatures. It makes me wonder why legislators think that they can tell my parents and my doctors that I can't get the care I need to be happy and healthy. I want all of you to look at me here now and hear my words. I am a very happy 16-year-old girl. I have wonderful friends who accept me for who I fully am, and I am active on my school's debate team and other curricular activities. I love to travel. I enjoy concerts and music like Taylor Swift and listening to my record collection in my room. I get all A's in school, and I am looking forward to college. I am not miserable in my life. I am not depressed. I'm just trying to be in a teenager in America. S same as any other teen. But I keep having to jump through hoops that other people don't have to. I keep having to spend spring break lobbying for my rights to exist while my friends are on vacation. I am here in front of this committee instead of on my summer vacation just to ensure that my right to exist is not taken away. In Alabama, not one lawmaker was willing to sit down with me and my parents to learn about what it's really like to be transgender. Instead, these lawmakers pushed rhetoric and laws that weren't true and were not logical, saying things like transgender people are being groomed by our parents, which is nonsense. In support of these laws, my governor has decided to say horrible things about me and those like me in my state. I would love for you to imagine a moment if these statements were made about you or your kids. How would this make you feel? What would you do to protect your kids from these harmful laws and statements? If you were me, would you want to stay in a state where the people who were elected to represent you uh, and make sure that you have a safe place to live and instead talk about your family this way. I live only a few miles from the best college in my state, but I can't even consider going there because of the continued attacks against me and my community. I've had to do a lot of thinking about college. Alabama was one of the first states to ban trans health care, but because of the new laws that have been passed in states across the nation and because we don't have the Equality Act to help protect me from discrimination, I've had to start looking at colleges very far away from where I was born and raised. My parents say this breaks their heart. They can't stand the thought of their kid being so far away where they can't help me if I needed them. 
This type of discrimination, which will make me have to move where I live or work to go to school, is not designed to protect or help me. I want you to understand that discrimination makes me unsafe. This journey isn't easy. As I first began my transition, there was an incredible amount of bullying in my middle school. <clears throat> um, so much so that my parents decided I needed to go to online school. Not because I wanted to, but the bullying got so bad it was getting close to violence and the school was doing nothing about it. We worked with the school and I eventually got to go back, but kids shouldn't feel helpless at school against being bullied or discriminated against just because they are different. Leaders in our state and country have the ability to help. However, so many of them have decided to promote that same bullying and di discrimination. Despite all this, despite being called a demon, a monster, or other despicable things, I love my life. I love my family, I love my friends, and I am happy. I am asking for you to help us stop certain people from using the transgender community as a political pawn. Please stop attacking our lives for votes or money. These are human rights hanging in the balance. Help us communicate that they are impacting people's lives and our pursuit of happiness. We are just like your kid, just like your neighbor, and you. We also deserve the ability to be happy. Thank you. Exactly five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Harley Walker. Mr. Sharp. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee. I'm Matt Sharp with Alliance Defending Freedom. America is a beautifully diverse and tolerant country. People from various walks of life with different beliefs and values peacefully live and work together and care for one another because we recognize the inherent dignity and worth that is endowed upon each of us by our Creator. The Hope Center in Anchorage, Alaska embodies these ideals by serving everyone in the community, no matter how they identify. The center provides women and men with meals, clothing, and job skill training and at night, it operates a women's shelter to provide a safe place for women fleeing sex trafficking and abusive situations. One night, a man who identifies as a woman tried to gain access to the women's shelter. He was drunk and injured, but the Hope Center staff wanted to help. So they paid for a cab to take the man to a local hospital to get the care he needed. Rather than applauding this act of charity, city officials accused the Hope Center of violating the city's gender identity ordinance and demanded that men be allowed to sleep in the women's shelter, just feet away from victimized women. This is just one example of how laws and policies that promote gender identity ideology violate women's rights, endanger children, and erode our constitutionally protected freedom to speak and act according to our conscience. Many of the federal government's rules and positions are driving this ideology. We've seen the administration put, push unlawful interpretations of Title IX and other laws that ignore the truth of what it means to be male and female. These policies demand that schools indoctrinate students in gender ideology and even hide students' mental health struggles from their parents. They ignore the physiological differences between women and men, allowing males to compete in women's sports. This exposes young women to greater risk of physical injury on the playing field and deprives them of the chance to compete, medal, and potentially even earn college scholarships. Such gender identity policies require that women's facilities, locker rooms, women's dorms, and shelters like the Hope Center be open to men, violating women's and girls' privacy, safety, and dignity. These policies are being used against students, like Liam Morrison, a seventh grader in Massachusetts. Liam was punished when he wore a shirt simply saying, there are only two genders, to peacefully share the truth about what it means to be male and female. In punishing him, the school mandated that students embrace its views on gender ideology and censored any dissent. Such viewpoint discrimination is abhorrent to our First Amendment. And for years, state and local governments have misused public accommodation laws to coerce people who serve everyone, regardless of who they are, to speak messages with which they disagree on pain of investigation, fines, and even jail time. For example, Colorado officials are misusing a state law to censor Lori Smith, owner of website design company 303 Creative, and require her to create designs that violate her sincere beliefs about marriage. Lori, who's awaiting a decision right now from the US Supreme Court, is hoping the court will uphold the freedom of all Americans to speak what they believe without fear of government punishment. But perhaps the most troubling campaign is the push to uh, give dangerous and potentially irreversible gender transition procedures to children. Puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones put kids on a one-way street towards medical transition. They harm healthy bodies, turn children into lifelong patients of gender clinics, and irreparably deprive kids of the chance of becoming natural parents later in life all with no proven long-term benefits to the child compared with safer mental health treatments. 
After seeing the poor outcomes and continuing high suicide rates among those who had medically transitioned, many of the European countries that pioneered these procedures began correcting their mistake. They reversed course to prioritize counseling and psychotherapy over drugs and invasive sterilizing surgeries. Yet despite the totality of the best evidence in Europe's example, government officials are ignoring the science and pressuring states, medical providers, and even parents to support the harmful medicalization of children. Knowing this, Congress should reject laws and policies like the misnamed Equality Act that push a government-mandated view of sexuality and identity and that have devastating consequences for children, women, charitable organizations, and all Americans. They're unnecessary, unjust, and they erode the true tolerance of differing views that is the hallmark of our great nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. Dr. Lopez. Good morning, dear senators. Thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak at this Judiciary Committee. I am here today representing myself and not my place of work, hospital, or institution. I am a pediatrician trained in pediatric endocrinology. I have been providing gender-affirming care to transgender youth for more than 10 years in Texas. I have also published scientific research that shows that gender-affirming care improves the psychological well-being of transgender youth. I am here today to be the voice of my patients and their parents, because in Texas and in other states where bills banning gender-affirming care are being passed, the lives and future of transgender youth are at risk. The parents of my patients are debating whether to flee their state amidst high financial, family, and social costs. The effects of the campaign of misinformation that led to these bills are also having chilling effects beyond healthcare access. My patients and their parents are suffering from discrimination at school, at church, at social gatherings, everywhere. Many families unable to leave the state are pulling their children out of school and isolating them, living in hiding. The general public should know that a campaign of misinformation has falsely demonized healthcare for transgender adolescents which is based on more than two decades of research and clinical practice and is accepted as established medical care by every leading medical organization in this country, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, and many others. There is no professional medical association involved in the care of transgender youth that opposes this care. Gender-affirming care does not involve genital surgery in minors and no medical interventions are provided before the age of puberty. Gender-affirming care consists of puberty suppression after the onset of puberty, which then may be followed by hormone therapy in later adolescence. In accordance to the Endocrine Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, this treatment can be medically necessary and life-saving. This care is based on a careful, individualized assessment of adolescents which significant and persistent gender dysphoria, which, when left untreated, predictably can cause serious harms, including anxiety, depression, suicidality, and other negative physical and mental health impacts. In contrast, research has shown that when these youth receive the medical care they need, they can thrive. This care is not pushed by doctors or parents. It is a highly complex decision that involves mental health providers, that includes assessing the stability of the gender identity over time, and the maturity of the adolescent to assent to treatment. Importantly, the parents I see in my practice, which is true of practitioners across the country, come from all backgrounds, including conservative and religious ones. My patients who are supported by their parents and receive timely gender-affirming care often have no mental health issues, and they thrive. I also want to speak up on behalf of science and medicine and my colleagues. Gender health providers and hospitals are being attacked by extremists. Politicians are deciding how medical care should look like with disregard of patients, parents, science, experts, and legitimate medical societies. Banning this care also risks the advancement of this medical field and its research. This is a dangerous precedent for our society as a whole and harms us all. Banning gender-affirming care interferes with the ethical principles of medicine, which includes patient autonomy and do no harm, 
and to provide the best treatment available. Physicians are being left to decide whether they should violate their medical ethics or break the law. I ask that the complex medical decision of whether to receive gender-affirming care is left to parents, patients, and their health providers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and be heard today. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Ms. Gaines. Good morning, Senators. My name is Riley Gaines, and I'm an advisor for Independent Women's Voice. I recently graduated from the University of Kentucky, where I was a member of the UK's Women's Swim and Dive team. I proudly finished my career as a 12-time NCAA All-American, a five-time SEC champion, the SEC record holder in the 200 butterfly, making me one of the fastest Americans of all time, a two-time Olympic trial qualifier, SEC Scholar Athlete of the Year, and SEC Community Service Leader of the Year. But all of that to say that it's a lifelong journey competing at that level and it's impossible to put into words the amount of sacrifice and dedication that it takes. On March 17th of 2022, my teammates and I, as well as female swimmers from universities around the country, were forced to compete against biological male Leah Thomas. Thomas was allowed to compete in the women's division after competing as a member of the University of Pennsylvania's men's swim team for three years as Will Thomas. We watched on the side of the pool as Thomas swam to a national title in the 500 freestyle beating out the most impressive and accomplished female swimmers in the country, including many Olympians and American record holders, by body lengths. Previously, Thomas had been ranked 462nd at best in the men's division the year prior. The next day, I raced Thomas in the 200 freestyle, which ended up in a tie. Um, we went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second. Having only one trophy, the NCAA handed it to Thomas and told me I had to go home empty-handed. And when I asked why, which was a question they were not prepared to be asked, I actually appreciate their honesty because they said, Thomas, it was crucial Thomas had it for picture purposes. Thomas had to have it for the pictures. I felt betrayed. I felt belittled. I felt reduced to a photo op. But my feelings didn't matter. What mattered to the NCAA were the feelings of a biological male. In 1972, Congress enacted Title IX to end unjust sex discrimination in all aspects of education, including college athletics. But by allowing Thomas to displace female athletes in the pool and on the podium, the NCAA intentionally and explicitly discriminated on the basis of sex. Although the NCAA claim it acted in the name of inclusion, its policies in fact excluded female athletes, which are the very female athletes whom Title IX was passed to protect. But that is not all. In addition to being forced to give up our awards and our titles and our opportunities, the NCAA forced me and my female swimmers to swim to share a locker room with Thomas, a six foot four, 22 year old male equipped with and exposing male genitalia. Let me be clear about this. We were not forewarned we would be sharing a locker room. No one asked for our consent and we did not give our consent. And I'll, I'll set the scene a swimming locker room is not a place of modesty. You're undressing, you're fully exposed. And we were forced to take off our swimsuit in front of a man who was doing the exact same thing. If nothing else, I truly hope how you can see this is a violation of our right to privacy and how some of us have felt uncomfortable, embarrassed, and even traumatized by this experience. I know that I don't speak for every single person who competed against Leah Thomas, but I know I speak for many because I saw the tears. I saw the tears from the ninth and 17th place finishers who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can attest to the extreme discomfort in the locker room when you, from these 18 to 22 year old girls, when you turn around and there's male eyes watching in that same room. And I can attest to the whispers and the grumbles of anger and frustration from these girls who just like myself had worked our entire lives to get to this meet. And I can attest to the fact that around the country, these female athletes who opposed the inclusion of Leah Thomas in the women's divisions were threatened intimidated and emotionally blackmailed into silence and submission. But unfortunately, our experiences are not unique. The number of female athletes who have been denied opportunities, traumatized, or hurt by policies that claim to promote inclusion is growing at an alarming rate. I hear these, these female athletes and their parents, um, I hear from these people who are seriously injured, one with permanent injuries um, that will plague the rest of her life because she was forced to compete against a much physically stronger man. This is unacceptable, and the integrity of women's sports is lost. It's unfair, it's discriminatory, and it must stop. Women's rights to privacy, single-sex spaces, and opportunities are being encroached on. Sports, sororities, locker rooms, dorm rooms, shelters, prisons. Some have tried to tar those 
of us speaking up for women's safety, security, and opportunities is transphobic or bigoted, and this is untrue. I've heard from people within this community, gay, lesbian, and trans-identifying Americans that agree females should not be asked to step aside and make room for male-bodied individuals no matter how they identify. Defending women's rights is not anti-anyone. Believing in biology is not bigoted. And following the science that there are only two sexes and that there are very real and important differences between the two sexes is not hateful, it's fact. I'll end with a quote very briefly from tennis legend Martina Navratilova. There will always be significant numbers of boys and men who would beat the best girls and women in head-to-head -head competition. Claims to the contrary are simply a denial of science. Um, I, I thank you guys for, for listening, and I, I truly hope you heard my story. Thank you, Ms. Gaines. Ms. Robinson. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, my name is Kelly Robinson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm proud to serve as president of the Human Rights Campaign, our nation's largest civil rights organization working to achieve full equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people across the country. Thank you for inviting me to submit testimony at this important hearing. On behalf of HRC's more than three million members and supporters, I've come here today with a single message. The LGBT people, LGBTQ plus people of the United States are living in a state of emergency. This is not an exaggeration. This is not a dramatization. More than 525 anti-LGBTQ plus bills have been introduced this year in the states. More than 220 of those bills target the transgender community, many targeting children, trans ch transgender children. And more than 75 of those anti-LGBTQ plus bills have now become law. This includes laws that ban books and censor curriculum in the classroom. This includes laws that forbid children from being able to safely use the bathroom at school and laws that criminalize doctors for providing life-saving, gender-affirming health care. The purpose of these laws is to facilitate a rise in political extremism by alienating and isolating LGBTQ plus Americans. And the impact of these laws is truly alarming. There's now more violence against LGBTQ plus Americans than ever before with mass shootings in our safe spaces, murders of transgender people, and threats from the Proud Boys, neo-Nazis, and other groups the Southern Poverty Law Center has designated as extremists. There is now more anxiety and depression among LGBTQ plus children. Data from our most recent survey of LGBTQ plus teens shows that these laws are making young people feel unsafe and can prevent them from seeing a full future for themselves. There are also more conversations among families about whether the state where they live is safe for their children. A mother of two transgender teens who is deciding whether to move from her hometown in Texas told me simply, we have accepted that this state is not safe. It is like a war zone. In every county you represent, in every county your colleagues represent, you will find parents and children, teachers and nurses, community, teacher, community leaders and small business owners who are afraid that the rise in legislative assaults and the political extremism has put a target on their backs. Such fear has no place in the United States of America. That's why for the first time in HRC's nearly half century history, we have declared this state of emergency. We've also issued a guidebook to help LGBTQ plus Americans stay safe as they navigate the new anti-LGBTQ plus laws and a report that details the impact of these laws for advocates, for policymakers, and for the media. I've submitted both into the record. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, we need you to help us answer the state of emergency with a sense of urgency. Today, Senators Merkley, Baldwin, and Booker will introduce the Equality Act, which would make protections for LGBTQ plus Americans consistent and explicit across our nation. It's been nearly a decade since this bill was first introduced, and in that time, LGBTQ plus members of the military have served openly. Marriage equality has been codified in federal law, and more LGBTQ plus members of Congress have been elected than ever before. Furthermore, today, more than eight in 10 Americans support comprehensive non-discrimination laws for LGBTQ plus people. It is time for Congress to catch up with where our country already is and pass the Equality Act. I wanna to conclude today by saying that although this is a state of emergency, I believe that we still live in a land of infinite possibility, a nation that prides itself on progress. For every Tennessee, there is a Minnesota which has recently passed a statewide ban on so-called conversion therapy. For every Florida, there is a Michigan 
which recently became the 22nd state to make LGBTQ plus non-discrimination protections law. For every Texas, there is a Pennsylvania, which is on the cusp of becoming the 23rd state to do so. For every Defense of Marriage Act, there is a Respect for Marriage Act. And for every extremist, there are many, many more Americans who support LGBTQ plus rights. Our nation is greater than all of this hate. And we must take action now to end this emergency and secure equality for every American, without exception. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Well, I'll start the five minute rounds and I'll begin. Uh, Lindsey Graham's my friend and my colleague. We see things differently and we still get along, which I think is the nature of good work in Congress, at least I hope it is. I would say to him, it is interesting to me that you cannot put a nominee for the Supreme Court of the United States at that table, and they all sit there, without that person expecting a question as to whether or not they're going to be influenced by foreign laws. Will you look at laws in other countries, or are you going to stick with America? And the answer they're waiting for is, I stick with America. And now we have references to Europe as the standard bearer in terms of where America should go for its future. Secondly, uh, if we're called an outlier in that headline, guilty as charged. America has always been an outlier. A written constitution for over 200 years, a bill of rights that people can depend on. We are outliers. No one in Europe can make the same claim. So I would just start with the premise, I love Europe, I love the Europeans, but we're Americans. And when it comes to the decisions as basic as the rights of our individual citizens and freedoms, I think we've got a pretty good starting point with the Constitution and Bill of Rights. I want to ask you, Dr. Lopez, there have been references made here uh, to whether or not your profession and what you've done with your life for the last 10 years is an outlier itself, that in fact uh, that you're not doing what is mainstream medicine in America. How do you respond to that? That is not true. Um, the type of care that I provide, gender-affirming care, is the mainstream standard of care, best practice, um, recommended, recommended by all the legitimate medical societies in the United States and across the world. And um, as I said in my, in my opening statement, we have a clinical experience of more than 20 years and a robust ev body of evidence that supports this treatment as life-saving decreasing depression and anxiety. There are no other studies that support any other treatment. So this is the main, the mainstream, accepted, mainstream treatment. And accepted by the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics as well? Correct. Is there any major professional medical organization in the United States of America that opposes this form of care? No. That speaks for itself. We're talking about science and medicine versus a political spin on the issue. I want to say I'm old enough to remember the debate on the Equal Rights Amendment 50 years ago. The fears, if we pass the Equal Rights Amendment, w women will be serving in combat. You know what? Women are serving in combat because they want to serve in combat and we need them. If we pass the Equal Rights Amendment, we're going to have men and women sharing the same bathrooms. Have you been to restaurants with all gender bathrooms? I've seen them quite frequently in Chicago, and I'm sure you've seen them too. When I listen to Ms. Gaines, I think there's a fundamental call for justice in your statement. I understand it. We've got to be able to work that out as a nation, and not at the expense of Haley Walker and her future. There has to be a middle ground here that is fair to both. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's our job on this side of the table to deal with that moving forward. Dr. Lopez, you said, and I want to make sure it's on the record clearly, that accepted medical practice in this field does not provide for surgery for youth. Is that correct? Their, their genital surgery is not recommended for minors. That is the standard of care. And in terms of hormone therapy, it, it does, is not administered until after puberty? That is, a, that is recommended in adolescence. And if you went forward with any surgery at any point, or even medications that we're talking, has it been your practice to involve the parents of the young person involved? That is the standard of care. Parents, all legal guardians of parents, have to consent to the treatment. That's part of the 
medical decision making is to involve the parents and discuss the risk and benefits like with any type of medical treatment. And at the end of the day, it is the parents that consent to the treatment. Ms. Robinson, you've noted the resurgence, if you will, of anti-LGBTQ uh, legislation across the country. A lot of it's focused on the transgender issue, but not exclusively when we look at the body of legislation. What else is uh, coming up in the state legislature that concerns you? I mean, we're concerned about bathroom bills reemerging, not moving forward, explicit non-discrimination for protections for the communities and so much more. And for me, what's even more concerning is the violent rhetoric that surrounds every introduction of a bill. I mean, it's contributing to the fact that one in five of every hate crime is now motivated by anti-LGBTQ plus um, uh, bias. This is an urgent problem facing our community and creating fear and isolation even when the bills aren't passed into law. Thank you. Senator Graham. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Robinson, the state laws that you referenced regarding uh, transgender, do you think they're driven by hate, ignorance? What's causing this? I mean, we know that the people behind these bills are part of a well-funded opposition groups. Organizations like the Alliance to Defend Freedom are a part of that. Do you think it's driven by hate? I think it's driven by a well-funded group of opposition. I didn't ask you where they get the money. I asked you their motivations. I think it's driven by power. I think that there is a mo move right now to control people and our bodies for the sake of power. I don't think it's about Just people. for power, right? Excuse me? You don't me? think these are hateful people that are doing this? I think that this is about power, but I do think that as the bills are moving forward, they are creating a culture of hate. And I have to say again that every time we see the introduction of these bills, they are accompanied with violent online campaigns that well, call my community I, I groomers and pedophiles. I tell you that violent rhetoric has no place in this debate or any other debate. Uh, Ms. Gaines, <clears throat> what's the average day like for a young lady trying to compete at the level you've competed at in terms of training? So I started swimming when I was four. Um, I graduated college when I was 22, so I dedicated 18 years of my life to my sport, which of course includes your sport-specific training, swimming, but also weightlifting, also your diet, also your sleep schedule, not to mention the social sacrifices you have to make. At the collegiate level, we were swimming in the water every single day for six hours, three of those hours being before 8 a.m. So you practice from five to eight, you go to class, you come back to practice, you swim from 1.30 to 4.30. We ate dinner at 5 o'clock because we were starving. Um, eat dinner, do your homework, ice your shoulder, go to bed, wake up, you do it all again the next day. We were swimming over 10 miles on average every single day. Uh, Dr. Lopez, <clears throat> do you believe that Leah Thomas had a, an advantage uh, in swimming because... She was a biological male who transitioned sometime late in college. I am not a sports medicine physician. Um, I can only um, relate to the stand of the sports medicine federal um, associa international association. What do they say? They do not recommend the exclusion of transgender individuals in they sports. Believe, do they believe it's fair for Leah Thomas, who spent three years swimming for the men's team in the senior year of college, to compete in the women's division? They think that's okay? As, as a medical professional, I don't have the scientific well, expertise let, let me to you provide an opinion. Let me tell you as a person, you don't need a medical degree. This is not okay. This is definitely not okay. You work all your life training <clears throat> in, as a swimmer, competing against biological girls, and you wind up your senior in college competing with somebody who three years swam as a guy. And you lose. Uh, Ms. Robinson, do 80% of Americans support biological males competing in women's athletics? I can say more than 70% of Americans believe that the no, rash the, of, of attacks on trans no, it's sports the really is the wrong political simple priority. Question. Do 80% of Americans support biological males participating in female sports? I mean, what I, I can't verify that, but what I can well, say is I can is tell that, you it's not even close. 
that there's nothing wrong with you if you have a problem with Miss Gaines feeling cheated. There's nothing wrong with you if you have a problem with Miss Gaines feeling uncomfortable in a locker room. There's nothing wrong with you. Now, we'll sort this out as a nation, but this idea that something's wrong with her because she feels cheated is absurd. You have every right to feel that way. And I imagine a lot of young ladies do feel uncomfortable being in a locker room under the situation you described. Mr. Sharp, what's the purpose of your organization and what's your message to America? Yeah. Senator, we want to protect the freedom of all Americans, um, and that includes our desire to ensure that children and women, that their interests are protected, that they're not harmed by this gender ideology that's being pushed, um, and that each of us is free to, to live and work and speak without being coerced or punished by the government because of our good faith beliefs. One final question, Ms. Gaines. Um, do you think the experience you had um, in the dressing room is something that young girls throughout the country share your views? I get messages every single day from girls of all, all over the political spectrum. We mentioned this issue of being politicized. This is not politics for me. This is a real life issue, and I wanna put it on record. I don't believe trans athletes should be banned from sports. That's the rhetoric that's being pushed from the opposition. Um, Anti-trans bill bans trans athletes. Trans athletes should not be banned from playing sports. Of course not. I just want everyone to compete where it's fair and where it's safe, and I don't understand how that's, that's overly controversial. But yes, um, especially at that NCAA championships, every single girl, at least on my team, being a team captain, I had these conversations with my team, and there was 40 girls on my team, we all felt the same way. I've had the conversations. We all felt uncomfortable in that locker room. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to all of our witnesses today uh, for sharing your stories and your experiences. Um, let me talk um, initially to Ms. Walker, if I could. Thank you. Um, as a parent of three children myself, I can only imagine how proud your parents must be of your poise and your advocacy. Um, and thank you for sharing with us um, that you're a straight-A student and participating in school and happy. Um, it is um, a very difficult thing to insert yourself into these very heated debates in your home state of Alabama and nationally. Um, and I, I could feel your frustration um, explaining that as you search for college, you feel you can no longer safely do so in your home state. Um, I just don't think that's right. And I think someday soon uh, we may be in a place where uh, young people can search out their college dreams without having to worry about whether they're in a state that uh, affirms them or not. You mentioned something about this is not an ideology that's been pushed on you. Could you just help us for a moment understand, um, you described consulting closely with your parents, then with your physician, um, to make a decision about your future that reflects who you are and how you were created. Can you just help us understand that a little bit further, Ms. Walker? Yeah, so um, when I, like I said, whenever I was about um, 11 years old, I was doing research on the LGBTQ community and I came across the term uh, transgender. And growing up as a kid, I always knew that I was different. And so I came to my parents with uh, saying that I think I am transgender. And at first, uh, we didn't really know what that meant. Uh, we weren't super educated on the issue because you know, those, uh, at that time, it wasn't a big public issue. Um, and so whenever we went to our doctors, um, they were all incredibly supportive. And they never were telling me what I should do. The entire first couple of visits were just listening to me, listening to my story, who I was, and what I thought was best for me and what they could do to help me. It wasn't, you need to start these puberty blockers immediately. It wasn't, you have to do all of this to identify as transgender because everybody's journey is different. And they just wanted to do what was best for me and they listened to me to make sure that that was what I wanted to do. Thank you. Dr. Lopez, one of the things you mentioned was the importance of close consultation with parents in making a decision um, about gender affirming care. Could you just briefly speak to the role that parents play in your practice in making any decision about um, gender affirming care for their children? The decision to start gender affirming care is a highly complex decision 
it's not easy for, for any parent from any background. Um, most parents are not in, well informed when this happens to them. And it takes uh, a lot of time and effort to meet with different types of professionals, mental health providers and physicians to go discuss risks and benefits and potential alternatives, which is what should be done for any type of medical treatment. And, and what sort of impact do you see uh, on the mental and physical health of your patients in a state where there is a, a ban imposed on that sort of care or on uh, books or on discussions in schools? Does that have any impact whatsoever? I am very, very worried. That is the reason that I am here. I uh, am here because I am um, very worried for the mental health of my patients. Mm. Um, the ones that I see in my clinic, which are supported by their parents and receiving gender affirming care, are thriving. And <clears throat> if that is taken away from them, um, I am sure their mental health will worsen, not only because the treatment that helps them is taken away, but also because there's a, there's a feeling of stigma and discrimination that has been created around that. And as I say, they're, they're debating whether to leave or hide. And it's really, it's really devastating. Mr. Sharp, if I might, um, in your written testimony, you criticized schools for trying to replace parents as the ultimate determinants of, of what's best for their children um, when it comes to things like teaching about LGBTQ rights and issues. Um, but if I understand you correctly from your spoken testimony, you also think parents should be barred from making medical care decisions uh, about their own children. Uh, in the case of gender-affirming care as described by Dr. Lopez, which one is it? Are parents in charge of what's in the best interest of their children or not? Thank you, Senator. We do support the right of parents, but our laws have long recognized that there are limits to those and that parents can't consent to things that can be damaging and harmful. And that's why when the European countries, they're looking at the science. This is about following the science, and they do so. They find that there's not evidence of mental medical transition producing good outcomes versus the mental health counseling. And that's what we want to prioritize is so that parents can choose among the psychotherapy counseling and other options to truly help children dealing with gender dysphoria. Thank you. Dr. Lopez, if I might, just in conclusion, your testimony was that the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics both support gender-affirming care as an option uh, for children and their parents to choose in consultation with physicians. Is that correct? That is correct. And how do you reconcile what Mr. Sharp just said about the EU with our national medical associations that are relevant to this care? First of all, no country in Europe has banned gender-affirming care. They have taken steps to uh, make sure that there is a cautious approach when deciding eligibility for gender-affirming care. And actually, the steps they have taken are very similar to what is the standard of care practices recommended by the Endocrine Society and the WPATH, which does uh, recommend a very careful, comprehensive, uh, lengthy assessment before deciding that this is the best care for the patients. And there is no single research study that shows that psychological therapy, as mentioned by Dr. Sharp, is enough to resolve gender dysphoria and mental health issues that transgender people can have. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you, Senator Kuhn. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Ms. Gaines, I want to start with you. Thank you for your courage in being here today. Thank you for your courage and advocacy for women. You have been subjected to an unbelievable amount of abuse. You talk about intimidation, threats of violence, you have suffered it. I want to put up here a, a picture so everybody can see it. This was the welcome you were treated to at San Francisco State University just a couple of months ago when a, a mob assembled where you were supposed to speak, I believe for over three hours, screamed, threatened you, barricaded you in a room. Do I have that basically correct? Yes, I was held for ransom for three and a half hours um, by hundreds of these protesters, as you see on the board. Um, they demanded that I had to pay them money if I wanted to make it home to see my family safe again. The law enforcement in San Francisco, um, I respect, and I think law enforcement is what's brave, not me, and I respect all law enforcement, but what the law enforcement I was met with in San Francisco, in my opinion, failed miserably in effectively doing their job. Um, they had mentioned that 
it was not ideal for them to be seen as anything other than an ally to this community. Um, and that was made very obvious in the treatment and effectiveness of, of removing me safely from that situation. What, why were you threatened and barricaded into a room and held for ransom for hours on end? I mean, what, what was it you were saying that was so, so terrible? I was invited to speak on my experience of my senior year in competing against a male. Um, nothing opinionated about what I shared. It was surely the exact lived experience of what me and my teammates and fellow competitors dealt with. And so I spoke. I, after my speech, there was, of course, a lot of protesters in the room, which I'm totally fine with people protesting. It's their right to protest. But what I'm not fine with is when it does turn violent in the way that it did. Because protesters afterwards, they rushed into the room. They turned off the lights. They rushed to the front. Um, myself and others were assaulted. And that's ultimately when I was held for hostage for three and a half hours. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, thank you for your courage in the midst of that. Let's talk a little bit about the message that you were sharing. And you started to talk about it in your opening statement. Just tell us about your experience, because nobody can question your experience. I don't think anybody sitting at the, at, at the table, and certainly nobody at this podium, has had uh, the experience that you have had. You were talking about just the incredible surprise, shall I say, to put it gently, of finding a biological man, a six foot four biological man in your locker room and having to accept that without being asked about it, without being told about it even. What was that like for you? Tell us about that. I, again, we only became aware we would be undressing next to a man was when we had to see a man undressing while we were simultaneously undressing. And so I immediately left the locker room and I went up to one of the officials on the pool deck and I said, what are the guidelines to allow a man into our locker room? I know the guidelines for the competition, but what are the guidelines for the locker room? And he so nonchalantly said back, oh, we actually got around this by making locker rooms unisex. And so I'm thinking to myself in these brief moments, first and foremost, you just admitted this is a male by acknowledging how you had to change your rules to make the locker rooms unisex. You acknowledge that we do not share the same sex, first and foremost. Secondly, unisex, any man could have walked into our locker room, any coach, any official, any man who wanted to would have had full reins to and bare minimum we weren't forewarned about it. And that's, that's the traumatizing part. Of course, the experience in and of the locker room itself is traumatizing, but I think for me, it was so easy for them to dismiss our rights to privacy. Um, Senator Durbin, in, in your opening statement, you had mentioned this rhetoric. It's, um, you had mentioned that what message does it send to trans individuals? And my combat to that is what message does this send to women, to young girls who are denied of these opportunities? So easily their rights to privacy and safety thrown out of the window to protect a small population, protect one group as long as they're happy? What about us? That is the overall general consensus of how we all felt in that locker room. Why do you, why do you think it is that the, the NCAA and so many people in power seem intent on just erasing your opinion, your views, the whole category of women. I noticed that recently you just posted this to social media about a message that Harvard was sending around, I think, to its swimmers, telling them, don't talk about Leah Thomas, don't share your opinions. If you get contacted by a member of the media, then refer that to the university. Don't say anything, for heaven's sake. Tell us about this. I mean, this has been your experience over and over and over. You're told as a woman, just shut up, don't say anything. What's that like? That is continually happening. And if we do speak up, you're immediately labeled as some, as some name. They will call you everything under the sun, whether it's transphobic, homophobic, racist, white supremacist, domestic terrorist. They will throw them all at you in hopes to deter you, in hopes to silence you. Um, Leah Thomas's teammates, they were forced every single week to go to mandatory LGBTQ education meetings to learn about how just by being cisgender, they were oppressing Leah Thomas. They were told that they're not allowed to take a stance because their school has already taken their stance for them. They were told that you will never get a job, you will never get into grad school, you will lose your friends, you will lose your scholarship and playing time if you speak out. They told these girls that if you do speak out, and any harm whatsoever comes towards Thomas's way, whether that's through social media, whether that's physical, mental, emotional harm, then you are solely responsible and you could be responsible for a potential death. And you don't want that, do you? Of course not. Who would ever want to be responsible in a potential death? But that is the emotional blackmail that is plaguing this country, especially in universities. Last question, and I'll, just, I'll ask this and then give you a chance to respond, and I'm, I'm done with this, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me give you a chance to respond to something that Leah Thomas said recently, publicly. This is, um, she said this publicly. They're using, this quote now, 
they're using the guise of feminism, they meaning you, using the guise of feminism to sort of push transphobic beliefs, meaning you advocating for women, women's rights, is actually just a cover for transphobia. Do you want to respond to that? Feminism is not a fluid term. Um, the original and, and the meaning of what it means to be a feminist is to uphold, respect, honor, embrace, and celebrate women on our own physical ceilings, our own uniqueness. That term has not changed. Um, and what this really is is a, is a male mansplaining what it is to be a feminist, which I honestly think is pretty ironic, and it's something we've seen before. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, since reference was made to my earlier statement, I would just like to add something for the record. There is no evidence that transgender athletes are an issue in certain levels of sports. No transgender female athlete has ever won an Olympic medal in women's sports, though the International Olympic Committee has allowed transgender athletes to compete since 2004. 2004. One non-binary athlete who was assigned female at birth won a medal in women's soccer in 2021. Next is Senator Klobuchar. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to uh, turn to you, um, Ms. Robinson, and um, talk about something that I think it's important, uh, given my background as a prosecutor, that we don't forget, and that is um, the attacks that we've seen, the unprecedented number of attacks on LGBTQ Americans. Um, we know that LGBTQ Americans continue to face violent attacks, um, and um, there's hateful rhetoric dehumanizing them, and that is one of the contributing factors. This year, the FBI found that crimes motivated by bias against LGBTQ people represented 20% of all um, reported hate crimes. I just, this is um, close to my heart because when I was a prosecutor, um, I uh, was, uh, I'd never even been in, I remember the White House. Uh, president Clinton was president and he introduced um, the hate crimes bill and I got to meet the family of Matthew Shepard. They were there along with the police who investigated the case. Um, and I think that was a moment for America that kind of flipped how people thought about things and realized uh, that he was just pursuing his own life and ended up as the investigators described it, looking like a scarecrow, someone thought, um, pinned to a fence. Um, could you talk about what trends you are seeing in LGBTQ hate crimes? And why don't you answer that first? Yeah, the reality is scary. I mean, we're sitting here seven years since the Pulse nightclub shooting where 49 lives were stolen, and just over seven months since the shooting at Club Q that stole five lives from the community. Um, this uptick of violence is real, and you've said it already, one in five of every hate crime is motivated by anti-LGBTQ plus bias. The other reality that we know is true is that these bad bills targeting the community are often accompanied by campaigns of misinformation and lies that sow fear and transphobia in communities. The very fact that we can't identify Leah Thomas as a transgender woman is playing into the fear and anxiety that's motivating these hate crimes. I talk to people every day. I talk to pediatricians that are being escorted to their cars by, cars by armed guards because of the bomb threats that they're receiving. I talk to drag queens who are being confronted by proud boys with AR-15s outside of drag queen story hours. This epidemic is real and requires action, both legislative and also cultural in stopping this, this ability for people to just spout lies about our community. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Minnesota in your opening remarks, and I think what we've seen um, over the last few decades, we have seen progress in the fight for equality, the bipartisan uh, group that worked on uh, the Respect for Marriage Act, um, uh, led by Senator Baldwin, and we so appreciated her work um, and how she worked with people on both sides of the aisle to get that done. Um, but half of LGBTQ adults still report experiencing workplace discrimination based on their identity. Um, could you talk about the Equality Act, why it's important, um, and specifically, are there still places in the U.S. where an LGBTQ person can be denied a home simply because of who they are? Is that correct? 
Yes, absolutely. Right now, there are only 23 states that have explicit non-discrimination protections on the books for the LGBTQ plus community. What that means is I could go into a restaurant in Texas and be denied service because I'm married to a woman. It means that some members of the community can experience discrimination in housing and getting access to federally funded colleges and programs. This is really a crisis. We need to make clear that in this country, there's not a patchwork of protections based on your identity. Every American American deserves equal access to civil rights and non-discrimination protections. The, equal, the, equal, um, the Equality Act will move forward that into law. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a major company supporting the bill, that there's been a lot of support for it. Um, one other question along those lines, um, are there still places in the U.S. where an LGBTQ person can be denied a loan even uh, because of who they are? Yes, there are. Okay, very good. Um, could you talk about some of the progress? You mentioned um, Minnesota, uh, but some of the progress that have been made in states on a state-by-state -state basis, which I think shows um, how, in fact, there are a whole lot of people uh, out there um, who support um, the work of HRC um, and bills and state versions of bills like the Equality Act. I know that my state, as you mentioned, um, has been a leader. We were on a leader on uh, anti-discrimination from the very beginning. In 1993, uh, we began protecting LGBTQ people against workplace discrimination. Um, we were the first state in the nation to outlaw discrimination based on gender identity. Um, so could you talk about progress? Absolutely. There has been incredible progress for our community. You know, if I look back 20 or 25 years, 60% of Americans oppose same-sex marriage, and now nearly 80% support same-sex marriage, and the Respect for Marriage Act is the law of the land. That changed because we were able to serve openly in the military. That changed because we were able to tell the stories of our lives and show what our love looked like. That changed because now the majority of Americans know someone who is lesbian, gay, or bi. We need to make sure in this fight that we're not letting people's lack of visibility seed into fear and instead tell the stories about trans women, tell the stories about trans men, show the stories like Harley's that show that at the end of the day, these are simply Americans who are trying to live. That's what we're fighting for. Okay. Well, and thank you to all the witnesses. I wish I could ask you all questions, but my colleagues are waiting. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for taking your time to be here today. We certainly appreciate that. And um, Riley, I want to come to you. Uh, Riley is a Tennessean, and we are so incredibly proud of her work and the job that she is doing. And one thing that I have noticed repeatedly over the last few years is this administration's intent that they continue to push forward, uh, erasing the word woman, uh, their intent when it comes to ending Title IX and ending the ability for young girls. You know, in Tennessee, uh, I talk a lot about the Lady Vols, a great basketball team with such great history, and that how important it has been to young girls. When I talk to girls that have played on that team, they talk about the impact that being able to be a Lady Vol and what that had on their life, uh, what that impact was to them personally and professionally. And they talk about the opportunities that were open to them because they were a lady of all. They were a competitor. And I say all the time, there are hundreds of young girls that are out there at their home beating that basketball against the backboard and the blacktop and trying to hone their craft so they can be a competitor. They can be an athlete. And I, I was so disappointed that this administration, the Department of Education, went so far as to propose a rule allowing biological males 
to compete in women's sports. And Riley, you've referenced the impact of, um, on young girls that this has and how it is kind of defeating, not only to when you are competing, but when you're preparing. And you reference the amount of work that you do, that 5 a.m. swimming, that five o'clock dinner, and the way you're double tracking to be a competitor and also get an education. So I want you to talk a little bit about the impact that keeping Title IX and what Title IX meant to you is you were that young girl training, hoping to get a college scholarship, hoping that you would be an NCAA college athlete. Talk about that. Absolutely. It's far bigger than athletic achievement. And I, I think that's something that gets lost, especially when we only have a few minutes to share our testimony. I shared how I, get, I didn't get the trophy, but let me reiterate, it's not about the trophy. I didn't care about holding the tangible object of the probably $5 production trophy. Um, it's about the opportunity. It's about the lifelong skills and characteristics you develop from playing sports. Playing sports, uh, aside from my faith, I, I put a lot of this in my faith, but Playing sports has given me the leadership to do this, the security to take the arrows, to, to be held hostage. It's playing sports that has given me that confidence, and no girl should lose out on that. It is far bigger than athletic success or chances for opportunity. It is about those transferable skills. Um, there was an Ernst & Young study that came out that said 94% of female C-level executives, so CEO, COO, CFO, 94% um, of those females were female athletes, and I think that is a entirely true testament of what it means to be an athlete um, and those skills that it provides you. And I want to mention really briefly, the rewrite of Title IX is an abomination. It is equating sex to gender identity, which means men would live in dorm rooms with women, men could take full, or men would have full access to bathrooms, changing areas, locker rooms. Um, Men could join sororities, which we're seeing happening. It's happening at University of Wyoming. Uh, men could take academic and athletic scholarships away from women. In this new rewrite, it's actually sexual harassment. If you misgender a trans-identified individual, it's sexual harassment that if you're in a dorm room um, and you're a woman and you feel uncomfortable sharing this room, dorm room, if you complain and ask to be moved, you're guilty of sexual harassment. And you mentioned the transferable skills. I think that is so vital. Give me like the top three skills that you developed by learning to be a competitive athlete. I think especially being two-year team captain at University of Kentucky, I would say the top three skills I learned were teamwork, communication, and leadership, without a doubt. And those are skills that translate to your career. I graduated with every intent on being in dental school, actually what I wanted to do is endodontics. I scored in the top percentile of the DAT, which is the dental admissions test. And that's what I, th I thought my life direction was going. Um, and those three skills I mentioned, teamwork, leadership, and communication, would have been crucial to becoming a dentist. And now I realize in my advocacy work, they're just as crucial in this field as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, both for you and the ranking member for holding this committee. And uh, thanks to the, uh, all five of the um, witnesses here. It takes a lot to be here, especially uh, two of our younger witnesses. Uh, I was terrified in speaking in front of crowds when I was your, both of your ages. And uh, it just is extraordinary to me, the, the raw truth and testimony that you've shared with folks here. Um, Ms. Robinson, I, w I just want to start with you because I still live in this little bit of a bizarro world where I have arguments with friends. I'm not talking about political friends. I'm talking about folks from my community who think I'm wrong when I say in most states in America, a gay American could post their pictures of their wedding uh, on, online and then the next day be fired from their job. I mean, literally most Americans think that this has already been accomplished somehow, that you, just by being gay, you can be discriminated against uh, at your workplace, you could be discriminated against in public accommodations, you can be discriminated against in um, getting access to financial means that most Americans take for granted. You could be discriminated against even serving on a jury. Uh, could you speak to that for a moment? And just like, I know we're talking about a lot of issues here, but that to me seems outrageous. Absolutely. This is very real and why we need the Equality Act. What the Equality Act would do is make explicit non-discrimination protections across race, 
uh, gender, sex, and, ge and sexual orientation. That's currently not something that exists. You know, one of the reasons that we did the state of emergency is to lift up this crisis and make it clear, especially as Americans are thinking about where they're going to go to school or taking new jobs across the country. We had to make it clear that there is a dizzying pass patchwork of protections for LGBTQ plus people across this country. In service of that, we issued a guidebook that includes know your rights resources, where you can go to file complaints, um, and then also tools to navigate some of these more hostile states. Can, and if I can just interrupt you, because um, I had the privilege of serving with John Lewis, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with Senator Merkley and Senator Baldwin to, to lead on this bill in the Senate, but on the House side, John Lewis was leading on this bill. And when you asked him, uh, here's this you know Christian, Southern, black, elder man, and he would say that these issues are so similar to what he was dealing with. The same things people said about why they didn't want black people in their uh, restaurant, why they didn't want black people to marry white people, why uh, they didn't feel comfortable with their private business, why do I have to hire black people? People use religious excuses, cultural excuses. This is my own uh, 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 belief that it's wrong. Um, the Bible says it's wrong. Um, it, it is amazing to me that growing up with two black parents talking about the struggles of the time uh, who did get denied jobs and promotions, uh, who did see uh, violence um, and threats, uh, who told stories about white people and black people that were attacked for standing up for equal rights for African Americans. Uh, am I wrong to draw this basic parallel of human dignity, uh, whether it's gender discrimination, uh, discrimination against LGBTQ Americans, black Americans, Muslim Americans? Is there a line that goes through about the basic right to be an American and have equal rights? Absolutely. This is fundamentally a civil rights issue. The Equality Act has to be signed into law to give us all equal access to that American dream. And I think the other through line here is that oftentimes we've been able to find ourselves on the right side of these social issues. You know, for example, the same things that they're saying about trans people today, they were saying about lesbian and gay people 20 years ago, and now the Respect for Marriage Act is the law of the land. The same horrific things they're saying about trans people today, they were saying it about people that lived with HIV and AIDS 30 years ago, and now we've significantly reduced stigma, and we're on our way to ending that epidemic in this generation in our lifetimes. We can make change on this, but it starts by opening our hearts and minds and acknowledging that in the story of America, so many of us have faced discrimination. When we've come together, when we fought and understood that an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us, we've been able to change the course of history. Um. I was very moved by uh, your testimony, Ms. Gaines, especially because I don't think most Americans understand what it is to be an elite athlete. Um, I'm here because I was a Division I player. Fundamentally, uh, 50, 60 hour work weeks uh, on my athletic skills. The first year I stepped out, you might have had this experience yourself. I felt like, oh my God, this is how civilians uh, sort of live when you have just so much time. <laughs> you know, you're not getting up and, and doing practices. The experiences you had, um, and the picture that my colleague, uh, uh, Senator Hawley, showed is just outrageous, deplorable, and unacceptable um, for you talking uh, to your truth. Um, Ms. Walker, uh, what, what stuns me about what we're seeing right now is that a lot of Americans don't understand how widespread the bullying and the threats and the violence are, not just to uh, uh, those of us who are uh, in elite competition, uh, who often face dealing with these issues as the NCAA is dealing with them, but the widespread nature. Um, I think, Ms. Robinson, in your longer testimony, you were talking about the unbelievable, something's happened in the last decade, of this rise of threats and bullying and violence and murder of uh, LGBTQ Americans at levels that are frightening to me. And Ms. Walker, I want to just end with you because I don't think most Americans understand what it's like to try to just live your truth for the average American that is LGBTQ or trans. Could you just tell one more time, as you've listened to the testimony today, just how it feels just to be a teenager living your life as you do? Yeah, um, it definitely is a struggle um, day to day. Um, Growing up in a conservative state where there is a lot of misinformation spread about what trans people are, uh, what we do, and how 
um, we're just like everybody else. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely been hard for me. Like I said in my testimony, I was severely bullied in middle school to the point where I had to drop out of public school because there was so much hate every day in the hallways being misgendered, being dead named, uh, and it got to physical violence at a certain point. And so I had to drop out of public school for that year and the school wasn't doing anything about it. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for, the, for the latitude. And again, if this is about protecting our children, the stories of Ms. Walker uh, and other uh, trans children, it just needs to be heard about what, what you're enduring. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Title IX was a landmark civil rights law. It helped create the incredible breadth of women's sports and girls' sports that we see across the country. I believe in girls' sports. I believe in women's sports. I'm the proud father of two daughters who are both athletes. I think participating in competitive sports is a wonderful thing for a young girl. I think it is a wonderful thing for a woman. And I think, unfortunately, today's Democrat Party has decided that women's sports and girls' sports no longer matters, and they're willing to push radical legislation designed to destroy girls' sports and women's sports. Ms. Gaines, I want to thank you for your courage. You are relatively young, but you have demonstrated incredible courage. And because you have dared to speak up, you have been demonized, you have been vilified. I saw when you were attacked by a leftist mob at San Francisco State University for daring to speak up. You had an incredible record as a swimmer at the University of Kentucky. You were a two-time NCAA All-American. You were a five-time SEC champion. You were at, you're an SEC record holder and a two-time Olympic trial qualifier. But yet, on March 27th, 2022, something changed. What happened on March, 26th, uh, on March 17th, 2022? That's when Thomas and I raced in the 200 freestyle and, again, resulted in a tie. And so you tied. What, what was the consequence of tying? We went behind the awards podium where typically you're handed your trophy, you're marched out, you're named an All-American. And so we go back there, and the official looks at both Thomas and myself and says, great job, but you guys tied. And we only have one trophy, therefore we're giving this trophy to Leah. And I question this, and I say, why? And at first, I, I shortened it in my testimony, but really he stumbled on his words. He didn't know how to answer this. And at first he's, uh, well, we're just doing this in chronological order. To which I further press, and I said, okay, well, what are you being chronological about? Because we tied. And if we're doing this off alphabetical order, G comes before T. So what are you being chronological about? To which this wasn't a script they had prepared for him. And he actually appreciated his honesty. He did say, we have to give the trophy for Leah because we, Leah has to have it for pictures. They've, they've made that clear. Leah has to have the trophy for pictures. You can pose with this trophy, but you have to give yours back. You have to go home empty-handed. Leah Thomas takes the trophy home. End of story. Now, let me ask you, as someone who's competed at the, at the elite level, in your experience, is, is, is there a difference between women and men? Of course. I think we learned this at a very young age, watching even 12 and unders play. Going through puberty causes irreversible um, advantage, that no matter the training, no matter the diet, no matter any alterable um, change you can make will overcome that male advantage especially in sports like swimming, where lung capacity matters so much. Um, even something as silly as throat size, men have on average a 40% larger throat, which sounds like it's nothing. But when you're grasping for air, that 40% larger throat makes a huge difference in athletic success, not to mention height. Um, you guys know the differences. Ms. Robinson, do you agree with Ms. Gaines that there's a difference between women and men? If the question is about trans women... I'm just asking, is there a difference between women and men? 
I mean, what I can say here is that the NCAA has rules in place. They've had rules in place for the last decade, and when this competition okay, okay, happened, I'm, I'm try the again. rules were clear. Do you believe there's a difference between women and men? It, it's a yes-no question. It is, it, do you believe there's a difference? Oh, I think that we're talking about this case with the NCAA. No, I'm asking a question. Do you believe there's a difference between women and men? Most think, people could answer this very simply. I, I'm curious if you're willing to do so. Oh, absolutely. I'm just putting it into the context of is the that conversation a yes? that we're having. I think that there are definitions it, related it, to is, sex. Is, is that a yes? So I'm trying to get a yes or no. I'm not trying to get, get a speech. It, oh, I, is I'm, there a difference between women and men? I think that there are definitions for biological sex. Okay, so you're not answering that. Let me gender. ask you this question then. Why do women's sports exist? If you can't define a difference between women and men, why not abolish women's sports and just tell little girls to swim with little boys and see who wins? Oh, I'm simply saying that um, that sex is My different question, than gender. Why and I do, do believe why that women's, do women's sports, sports have a great exist? value. I mean, Senator, I'll M tell you M right Ms. now. Ms. Robinson, please answer the question I'm asking you. Absolutely. Why do women's sports exist? I think that there are so many positive benefits to sports. But I mean, why have a separate category for women? If, if, you, if there's no difference between women and men, why to have women's sports? I'm saying that there's a difference between sex and gender, and that the NCAA has rules in place, which they have for the so last Mr. decade. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to enter into the record an, an article from Duke, Duke Law called Comparing Athletic Performances for the Best Elite Women to Boys and Men. And it goes through examining in 2017 the top records for women in the world in various track and field events. So, for example, in the 100 meter, the top record for women in the world was 10.71 seconds. Now, that record for the number one woman in the world in 2017 was in the year 2017 broken by 124 boys under 18. In that same year, the record for the number one competing woman in, in, in the 100 yard, 100 meter dash in the world was broken by a total of 2,474 men. If the radical Democrat agenda to destroy girls' sports and women's sports succeeds, little girls will not have a chance to compete. So I ask unanimous consent that this article be entered into the record. Without objection, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, uh, a recent Trevor Project poll found that 56% of LGBTQ plus youth respondents could not access the mental health services that they need. And this committee and others have discussed the state of mental health in America. It was in a crisis before the pandemic. It's been exacerbated by the pandemic and most acutely within the LGBTQ plus community and most acutely amongst its youth. So you couple these statistics with the country's lack of protections for the LGBTQ plus community. And it's clear to me that we need to do more to address these mental health disparities. Questions for Dr. Lopez. Uh, can you discuss the factors that contribute to these higher rates of mental health challenges? And uh, what would be the uh, impact of uh, tailoring and providing more mental health services and support for LGBT plus uh, youth? Uh, it is very well known in the literature that discrimination is a main determinant of poor mental health outcomes in LGBT youth. Uh, there is no question that um, discrimination, as has been discussed, has against LGBT youth has increased over the last few years, and uh, that is a uh, it is, there's research to show that that is a driver or wor of worsening mental health in LGBT youth. Um, so mental health um, is needed in LGBT youth for sure, um, but also we also need to work on the social aspects that drives that mental health issue, which is discrimination. Thank you, and uh, it seems that uh, unfortunately, as we should be providing more and stronger protections and support. Uh, too many jurisdictions across the country seem to be going backwards and putting uh, LGBTQ plus youth in more vulnerable uh, and dangerous circumstances. Um, you know, the, the next question I have is not, not a technical one, not a deep policy question, but uh, I wanna talk to you for a minute, Harley. Appreciate you being here today and your courage to speak up uh, and to share, you've shared a lot with the committee 
uh, and I'm glad you're uh, sacrificing a bit of what should be your summer vacation uh, to be here. Uh, you've talked about the love and support you receive from your parents and doctors and friends. Uh, for any of your peers who may be watching today, thinking about maybe how to talk to their parents, how to talk to their friends, maybe not in as uh, welcoming or comforting of a circumstance as you were blessed to have. What words of encouragement uh, would you offer to them given your experience and given your advocacy? Uh, the main thing I would want to convey to them is that they are not alone. Um, whenever I started my journey, um, I had just entered middle school, and as I said, I had to move to online school because of bullying. Um, and I was in a very dark place, and I felt very alone. I had no friends. I just had my parents who were luckily supportive. But, you know, as a child, you feel so isolated. Um, and so one of the things that helped me was um, getting involved in my community. Uh, my parents took me to our local uh, P flag. Um, which is Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. It was a group of uh, people who um, was just a round table of queer members of the community and allies who just came together to share their experiences and just have a good time. And I was scared going to that meeting, but as soon as I got there, I felt so welcomed. And it was the first time I did not feel alone. And so that's why I'm here today, to tell those trans kids that they are not alone, that I accept them and so many um, other people accept them for who they are because it's not a choice. And um, that regardless of what people say to you, just remember who you are and stick to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Senator Lee. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gaines, I'd like to start with you if, if I could. Um, and thanks again for sharing your story. Uh, I've, I've been touched and, and saddened to hear of the misogynistic and discriminatory treatment that you received from the NCAA, which I regard as nothing short of shameful. Um, but you've handled it um, uh, with, with grace and, um, and courage, and I appreciate that example that you're setting for so many women and girls across America. Uh, your story reminded me of, of a letter that I received from a constituent a couple of years ago a constituent who explained to me her own story uh, with girls and women's athletics. She explained that she would never have been able to go to college, never would have had a chance at a college education had she not done so under an athletic scholarship. Uh, and, and while she was in college, she became the most dominant uh, female track athlete in the state of Utah. And she was a two-time All-American sprinter who held the 100-meter record at BYU for 22 years. She told me that even at the height of her collegiate year, as one of the top female sprinters in the country, uh, she would sometimes go to help her dad, who, who coached high school track, and she would go to those, um, uh, those events with her dad. She said even then, uh, the high school boys could beat her because of biological differences between people who are born male and people who are born female. So what would you say to all the high school female athletes who worry about losing potential college scholarships? Uh, to say nothing of uh, the world in which we now face name, image, likeness, endorsements, things like that, all the things that they might forego as a result of having to compete for scholarships, endorsements, and notoriety with people who were born male. My message would be that it's not transphobic to acknowledge how women deserve respect, how we deserve safety, how we deserve fairness, we deserve our keeping our dignity. It's not transphobic to say that. Um, it, it's not transphobic to say that you can't change your sex. Sex is down to a chromosomal level, and that's not something that can be changed, and that matters in sports. Your biology, that sports is the one area where that your sexual chromosomes matter. Um, and again, I'll, I'll echo Harley's message as well, is you're not alone. The overwhelming majority of people regarding this issue of fairness in women's sports agree that having men in women's sports is wrong and that it's unfair and it's a violation to, again, our privacy and rights to safety as women. 
Um, so that would be my message, to be bold, be empowered, and before anything, stand firm in the truth, biological truth. Are you transphobic, Riley? That is simply not true. Do you hold anything against transgendered persons? Absolutely not. I agree Leah Thomas was following the rules set in place by the NCAA, and I have no problem with Leah Thomas. Um, I, I do believe there's a bit of selfishness and narcissism and entitlement surrounding this person in regards to the utter disregard that Thomas displayed for us in these situations. But I have no animosity towards Thomas. My problem is the NCAA. My problem is the Biden administration pushing a rewrite of Title IX. That is my problem, and that's why I'm here. That's why this issue has become political for me, because I realize that legislation is the way you curb these things. Um, I, I can't believe it's come to this, but I have no hate in my heart towards anyone, even the, the protesters who mobbed me. The first thing that I did was prayed for them. Um, I saw the soullessness, the vengeance, the violence in their eyes, and they do it in the name of love and inclusion and acceptance and tolerance and welcoming and embracing diversity, but they did not embrace my diverse thought. Um, that to me was what hate looked like. Nothing in my heart is hateful. How about the NCAA? Did, did the NCAA embrace your diversity? Tell, tell, me, tell me what uh, attempts that the NCAA made to accommodate you and other female swimmers who felt uncomfortable sharing an open locker room with a biological male? Nothing. They actually made us feel guilty for feeling as if we were uncomfortable. Um, time and time again, that's what we saw. There was even a group of girls who uh, undressed in the janitor's closet. They changed clothes in the janitor's closet because they felt more comfortable undressing in that environment than they did undressing next to someone with male gaze. And were they doing that because they were transphobic? They were doing it because they were violated. Tell me how they were violated. I think two, three, four years ago, if a man claims the identity of simply saying they are a woman, walks into a locker room, a DA would follow this man into a locker room, arrest him, and he's charged with sexual harassment, voyeurism, and decent exposure, and the list goes on. But this was celebrated. This was encouraged. Leah Thomas was then nominated for NCAA Woman of the Year, which is an award that I was also nominated for. But when I saw the full list of nominees and saw that NCAA Woman of the Year was not exclusive to just women, the award was immediately devalued and meaningless to me. That's how they were honoring this, rather than making us feel reassured in our feelings that this was wrong. When you accommodate men time and time again, refusing to accommodate women, we call that misogyny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. Uh, next up is Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Robinson, your testimony is really powerful on the issue not only of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation, but also the threats of violence and hate crimes. And you describe this entire emergency as a result of a coordinated moral panic. The refer the uh, reference to this emergency is unprecedented in the 50 years of the human rights campaign, which itself is noteworthy. I wonder if you could describe the, the links here that make it coordinated, that create the threat of violence, uh, the feeling that this community is, to quote you, constantly under threat and what relation it is to gun violence in particular at uh, Pulse and Club Q. You refer to both of those. If you could just expound on your testimony a little bit in that regard. Absolutely. Um, and I think that you know those real life examples of Pulse and Club Q show that this violent political rhetoric plus easy access to firearms equals real life harm, violence, death to my community. And while we're here talking about the issues that are truly affecting children, their health and their safety, the number one thing we should be talking about is gun violence. That is the number one killer of America's youth, but instead we are putting a target on the backs of trans kids. And when it comes to where this is coming from, we don't have to guess. I mean, the American Principles Project, their executive director said that they are targeting trans kids to quote, score political points. 
And every time we see these waves of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation move through states, over 500 bills just this year, we see it accompanied by campaigns of hate and bias online. In Florida, when the Don't Say Gay or Trans bill was moving through, you saw a 400% increase in language of groomers online targeting the LGBTQ plus community. Let's be clear that this is instilling fear in people. This is perpetuating transphobia and homophobia that has real life impact on harm on the lives of my community. Would you say that a lot of the rhetoric, the legislation, in a sense, gives license to the violence or encourages it implicitly, maybe without directly intending it, but nonetheless creates an atmosphere where the violence is more likely to flourish. Absolutely. You know, there was a speaker at CPAC that called for the quote unquote eradication of transgender. That sort of violent language takes away the humanity of people that look like me, the people experience the world like me, LGBTQ plus people across this country. It makes us seem less human. When you couple that with trying to censor education, remove our stories from schools, trying to criminalize or vilify loving parents for affirming their gender identity, this is creating a culture of fear and harm that's directly targeted at some of our most vulnerable, the LGBTQ plus community and trans youth. We should all see what's happening for the moral crisis that it is and know that because the attack is coming to trans youth today doesn't mean that that target can't be placed on someone else's back next week. This is a threat not only for the trans community, but for us all. I think that's a really important point that we are all at risk of this violence if the LGBTQ plus community can be targeted in this way. Anyone can be targeted. Anyone who's different is at risk. And this community right now is the most vulnerable, but others can be targeted as well. Senator Hirono and I have helped to lead hate crimes legislation, which actually um, has taken as one of its principal causes to stop exactly this kind of violence. And so I want to thank you for your leadership and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of our, uh, our witnesses here today. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I, I, I want to follow up by trying to understand your answer to one of Senator Cruz's questions. And if, if this is really a question, not a suggestion. Do I understand your position to be that there are two sexes, but there can be more than two genders? Um, I wouldn't even say two, and you know we've got Dr. Lopez here as well, but there's also the definition of intersex. I think that often in these conversations we're conflating sex and gender, and I do want to affirm here that trans women are, are women. That is their gender. Okay, but, but I'm trying to understand are you, do you make a distinction between sex and gender? Yes, sir. Okay. Explain that. Just, do you think there are more than two sexes? Um, I believe that there's a, a definition for intersex as well that I want to acknowledge. Um, but sex is okay, assigned so at birth. Three, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. I'm thoroughly confused. So you're, you're born, I'm talking about biology, male, female, and what else? I believe that intersex is also acknowledged, intersex. but again, I, I'm not a doctor here. What I can and what say does intersex mean? is that there's a difference between sex and gender, and different. I think in these conversations we're conflating the two. Well, well but, but I want to start with sex, okay? There's male, there's female. When a baby's born, before the baby has had time to, th to even have a sense of self, there's male, female, and intersex. There's a third... Sex? I believe that is true, but I would defer to Dr. Lopez as I'm not a physician. Okay. Um, and how many genders are there? I think the gender is expansive, and the definitions are always growing. Um, you know, today I can tell you, More I talk to young five? people More that than... talk about non-binary as... More than five? 
I think the gender is not a binary is what I'm trying but to is, say. But are there more than five genders? I'm just trying to understand. Are there more than five genders? Well, I mean, I think that there was a time where women wearing pants didn't feel like it was appropriate for their gender, are, and yet I'm wearing pants today. There, I think that there are ways that we question. express our are there more than that are five expansive. Genders? Are there more than five? I wouldn't subject myself to naming how many genders there are, but what I can say is, is that gender is a reflection. Number? Excuse me? There's an infinite number of genders? I think depending on your culture, there are a lot of different genders that, that exist. And I can also say that it's a term that's evolving. If you look at young people today, they really don't lean into the binary of only woman and man. So I think that it's incumbent upon us not to legislate on this, but create space for them to explore what their identities are, what their gender identities are. All right. <clears throat> Let's get back to athletics. I think I understand what you're saying. There are three sexes male, female, and intersex. I believe that to be true, but again, I'm not a physician. And so they're an infinite number of genders because gender is a mental state. Gender is about expression, and I think that there are a variety of ways that you can express your gender. Okay, so there's infinite number. All right, let's go back to the, to the biology. Male, female, boy, girl, okay? Biologically... Do males have an advantage over females biologically in sports? Again, I'm not a physician, and I, I can't speak to that. What's your real-world experience? Um, it depends. I mean, there are some people who are born male that I'm faster than if I were to sprint against them and some that I'm not. Some but, males so that are taller than some that, women and some that are shorter. You don't believe that a biological male has a physical advantage in sports over a biological female? Not as def a definitive statement. Give me an example. Well, no, I, I don't think. How, 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 how many female members of the NBA do you see? Well, I can say that, you know, there's been this news article about men that think that they could beat Serena Williams in tennis right? That they think that they could actually score a point on her. Um, and it's just not the case. She is stronger James, than that. What's your experience, Ben? Male, female? Both Serena and Venus lost to the 203rd ranked male tennis player, which they're phenoms for women. Um, my experience, my husband, he swam at University of Kentucky as well. In terms of accolades and in terms of national ranking, I was a much better swimmer than him. Um, he could kick my butt any day of the week without trying. Okay. I, I, I just think, Ms. Robinson, I under, I th I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. I think you lose a lot of credibility when you don't concede that a, a biological male ha has physical advantages over a biological female. I, I mean, I just think that's a proven fact, and you really hurt your credibility. I understand you, you won't the world to be a better place. I do too. And I don't think people ought to be discriminated against be because of an immutable characteristic. I don't. Um, and I, I think that um, I think everybody ought to be free to be themselves. And what you do in your bedroom or what I do in my bedroom with a consenting adult is nobody's business. But if what I do in, in, a, in, in my bedroom with a consenting adult, if I decide I want to tell somebody's child about it, then, I, then other people have rights too. And I think parents have rights. And I think biological females have rights to be able to compete fairly in, sport, in, 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 in sports. So I, I, really, I really think you hurt your credibility when you refuse to acknowledge that biological males have an advantage over biological females. It kind of makes me wonder about all your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chairman. Kennedy. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that there is not a definitive advantage in all cases. Sir, I don't know if you believe that you could beat Serena Williams in tennis, but I 
probably think that that's not the case. There are not all cases where all men are physically superior to all women. And at the end of the day, in this conversation, we're not talking about that. We're talking about trans women who are, in fact, women, who deserve to play in a gender that matches their sports, who deserve all the benefits that Ms. Gaines is talking about. And as a cisgender black woman, I can say definitively that my womanhood is not threatened by a transgender person asserting hers as well. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of the uh, persons who are testifying today. For Ms. Robinson, uh, do you know what percentage of women's sports consists of, of transgender participants? It is a very small number. I can say that there are about that the Williams Institute has um, estimated about 300,000 trans youth total in the United States. That's less than a percentage of a percent. And when some of these laws pass in places like Utah, they are putting into place broad sports bans that ban kids from playing as early as the age of five years old. In Utah specifically, uh, when the governor explored more about that piece of legislation, he last year called it cruel because it actually only impacted four trans students in the state and only one trans girl. So we know that there's a very small percentage of, of trans women that are actually playing in sports that these bills are targeting. So, you know, it, it's, it's, I hardly know what to say because uh, I would think that um, a human rights belong to everyone and that trans rights are human rights and we, I think we must do more to ensure that the trans community and the LGBTQ plus community more broadly can live as their authentic selves, free from the threat of and real violence or discrimination. So, Ms. Walker, uh, thank you very much for being here. Do you, do you play in sports? Do you participate or compete in sports? I do not. So uh, would you say that most, uh, I would think that, that most transgender uh, girls are not competing in sports, but they just want to, you just want to be able to be free from these kinds of totally discriminatory laws that, that, that uh, does not allow you to be yourself. Yeah. Um that's definitely the case, uh, whereas I don't personally compete in sports, so I can't speak for the trans kids mm -hmm. that do compete in sports. I will say that it's even more scary for us um, in situations like that, because can you imagine somebody like me competing, having to compete in a men's sports team? Um, that would be detrimental to my mental health, um, and mm -hmm. I would have, I would feel unsafe. Um, and so I think uh, things like the Equality Act are necessary to protect these trans people from discrimination because we have the right, I have the right as a woman, just as Miss Gaines has the right as a woman to compete in women's sports. And just because I wasn't born in a female body doesn't mean I don't have that same right. Thank you. And, and, and as long as we're focusing on sports, of course, we know that there are huge, huge differences in so-called male sports and the support that's given to male sports and male so-called male athletes versus uh, women's sports. And, you know, there's all kinds of data about the discrimination in these uh, in male, so-called male and so-called female sports. In fact, one of my colleagues who is very much opposed to transgender persons competing in female sports said if we allow transgender uh, persons to compete in, um, against uh, females that, that uh, we're going to see coaches encouraging boys to become transgender to compete against girls. Ms. Robinson, is this what's happening in sports? No, it is not. Um, there is an incredible process that people have to go through to come out that can be painful, that's about exposing yourself to your family, to your friends in different ways. I can't imagine someone enduring all of that uh, simply to play a sport. These are people that are only trying to live, as Harley has told us, to play sports that match their gender identities so that they can get all the positive benefits that we've talked about. Self-esteem building, self-confidence, the ability to work within a team. I just can't see why we would deny that opportunity to children as young as five years old. One last question. So we have all of these laws, don't say gay and other kind of laws. Um, maybe this is a question for Dr. Lopez. Uh, as you work with the uh, uh, transgender community, LGBTQ persons, so what do these kinds of uh, 
bans on books, what, what kind of impact do they have on the persons that you uh, treat? <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> these are, uh, one has to remember that transgender children and adolescents are already a vulnerable population. They uh, have to be make an extra effort compared to non-transgender children to socialize, to feel like they belong, to participate in sports, which they have the right to, as Harley said. And if there's um, already a climate of you can be targeted, you will be treated differently, these kids tend to isolate themselves. I have patients who have no friends, like zero friends. Mm. I have patients that are just do online or homeschool because they're terrified about going to school, um, let alone participate in sports. That can be terrifying for them. Um, and they, I, have, I have one patient that I saw last week that the mom told me is a 12-year-old who plays soccer and it's not competitive, it's just with the school. And she told me, this bill is gonna be devastating for my child. I will have to get out, move out of state if the, the bill that bans sports participation passes because that, is what's had, that has kept my child alive. That was the thing that helped me engage and uh, feel accepted with peers. So yes, all this climate is really harming the social life and the growth of, of, of these, my patients of these kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much. Um, appreciate this hearing, Chairman. Appreciate the panel being here. Um, Dr. Lopez, I don't know if I had a, my own hearing in another committee that I chair, so I'm coming late to this one. I apologize if this is a repeat question. Um, but I wonder if there is an age or a phase of life when young people begin to experience some uncertainty about their gender identity. Um, there is no specific age. Um, people can experience that their gender is different as young as two when they start talking. Uh, but um, by adolescence, most uh, people who identify as transgender do realize that their gender is different. And um, very often, puberty is a trigger uh, to realize this is not my gender because they're experiencing physical changes that do not uh, feel uh, consistent with them and their gender. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of people's experience is that Puberty is a rather hard time of life for a lot of kids, entirely apart from gender identity. Is that uh, supported by any evidence? And that being a teenager is a hard time of life, irrespective of gender identity, that adolescence is a difficult, awkward time of life. Is there any evidence to support those propositions, or is that just uh, my anecdotal experience? <laughs> Um, I, so I'm not a mental health provider, um, so I, I am not sure what specific data exists to show that adolescence is a difficult time, but at a, as a pediatrician, um, I do, I mean, um, see that adolescents, um, you know, children and adolescents need a lot of support from parents, from yep. their community to um, find who they are in different ways. Uh, social connection is very important, and parental connection is very important in adolescence. Uh, that's just a general uh, concept. Yeah, and I doubt that many of us in this room would like to uh, go back and relive our teenage years. Um, so if you accept the proposition that that period of adolescence and the onset of puberty and you know being a teenager and all of that is a difficult challenging and awkward time of life presumably it gets a lot worse when you add to all of the questions that kids experience in that phase of their lives the additional question concern uncertainty uh, awareness 
that you've got a different gender identity. Yeah, uh, so actually one of the benefits of gender affirming care is, is to not have to worry about their gender. So it allows children to go on with their lives, go to school, uh, do the normal kids or social activities that they want to do without to worry about their gender because if they're going through a puberty that feels wrong with them, they will not be comfortable in their skin to, do, to engage with peers, to go to school, to do the normal things that ki kids want to do because they're thinking about their gender all the time and thinking that they're not comfortable in their skin. So this is, at least initially, mostly happening with kids, right? Awareness of uncertainty about their gender or awareness that they are in the wrong gender, that's a... Well, it happens to transgender adults as well. But mostly it's kids. And transgender adults. Yeah. And it just seems to me that when we're dealing with a population that includes so many children that coming at this from a perspective of kindness and love and support is the thing that just we ought to be doing as fellow human beings. And um, at least that's the message I take away from this hearing. There's just no point being mean to these kids. They've got enough going on already. I just, if I can say something. Please. These are the bravest kids, just like Harley here. You can see how brave she is. These are the bravest kids there are because they're they have to fight every day to be themselves. Yeah. Um, and when they feel like they're losing their fi the fight, that's when they get depressed and commit suicide. And it takes also a lot of courage for these patients to go against the world, really, to advocate for their kids, to support them. So these are really good, loving parents that just want their kids to be happy and do the normal kids, normal things that kids do. And other grown-ups trying to score points off of all of that just strikes me as being very unfortunate behavior. It's Thank terribly you. unfair. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panelists for joining us today, to all of you for your, your testimony uh, and your courage in speaking publicly and speaking before the Senate. I think it's worth just stepping back and acknowledging the tremendous stress and anxiety that so many across the country are dealing with for so many reasons, but that without question, as we see in survey after survey, as we see from mental health professionals, from psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, that LGBTQ youth are experiencing, particularly in a political and cultural environment, uh, where as we've discussed today, these issues are being hotted up and exploited to score cheap political points and to divide people. And when we see vulnerable people targeted by powerful politicians for the purposes of dividing people and gaining power with reckless disregard for the impact that it has on particular children and young people who are struggling, who are bullied, who are marginalized, who are bravely grappling to reconcile themselves and how they feel about themselves with the expectations of family and society, and then a political environment is imposed upon them in which they're made the center of attention and a focus of criticism and hatred, children. I think it's worth just stepping back and powerful people in the U.S. Senate reflecting on the impact of 
our words, our deeds, our statements. Ms. Robinson, I have some data here from Georgia. Would like your, your view on it. Recent data from the Trevor Project. 72% of LGBTQ youth in Georgia experiencing serious anxiety. 59% symptoms of depression. 46% seriously considering suicide within the last year. Can you comment on the impact it has on vulnerable and marginalized youth when they're made political targets in this endless partisan power struggle in the nation's capital? It's, it's absolutely devastating. It's devastating the ways that we've put a target on the back of trans youth. And I think about the history of my movement when the AIDS epidemic came to the forefront in the 80s, by the early 90s, you had lost a whole generation of gay men. I don't want us to repeat that story with our trans youth. This is a time where we can offer them the support, the resources, the affirmation and validity of their existence to ensure that they survive. And when they do, we get people that are as whole and as happy as folks like Harley at the end of this table. This is a real opportunity for us to ensure that the most vulnerable among us is protected because our rights are and our civil liberties are intertwined. And Ms. Robinson, in addition to the impact on the mental health, the sense of whether or not one's community and society is welcoming and loving and kind, or whether one is being turned into a, a target and a bargaining chip between political parties and a struggle for power. It's, of course, not just the impact on the individual's mental health, but it's the risk of being targeted by a violent act or a hate crime. Additional data Nationwide, according to the FBI, nearly one in five hate crimes in 2021 were motivated by anti-LGBTQ bias. Between 2017 and 2020, DOJ data demonstrating extreme levels of violence against LGBTQ persons across the country. Again, just. I'm asking you, please, to remind the Senate that what we do here has a powerful impact on people's sense of well-being and on the risk they face of violence. Can you comment on the risk of violence, please? Absolutely. I mean, I talk to people every day that are living in a space of feeling isolated and fearing, fear, feeling fearful for their very lives. I talk to black trans women who, again, have experienced another deadly year, and they talk about going out the house to walk their dog or go to school and being fearful that that, that will be the day they don't get to go home again. I talk to parents of trans youth that are fleeing their state because they feel that their family and their child will not be safe and will not get to grow into an adult. This is a crisis, and the hardest part is that this is a crisis that is man-made, that the people can solve for by stopping these bad pieces of legislation and stopping the violent rhetoric that take away the humanity of trans people in the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here. You've been tremendous, and I mean every single one of you, because we're dealing with uh, issues that really affect people uh, in a very personal way. Uh, Ms. Walker, uh, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your uh, coming forward and telling us your story and sharing that. Uh, and I want to say thank you to every one of you. You know, this whole uh, challenge that we have uh, as a society, and it's not unique to U.S. society, of defining people who are other uh, as less, will, less uh, entitled to be fully accepted uh, has been an ongoing uh, situation that we face throughout our history. You know, it, recently in Vermont, uh, we were the first state to pass civil unions, and our incumbent governor who signed that bill nearly lost his reelection. And many of the arguments that are being made here about why that would be so bad dissolved <laughs> because once the law was passed and people were together, then what before had been seen as wrong 
uh, it we were allowed to see what love existed between these people who got a civil union. And then a few years later, Vermont was the fourth state to pass marriage. And uh, what Senator Ossoff was talking about uh, is kind of a dynamic, I think, that is only cured by acceptance. You know, we don't, none of us know what shoes each of us walks in. We just know we're all trying to figure out life and who we are and how we can be who we are and be fully, fully engaged in being a generous, open, and loving person to everyone else. So the Equality Act, I think, is so important uh, because it essentially acknowledges with the force of law uh, that LGBTQ plus folks are entitled to the same rights and protections as everyone else. So uh, that's my statement here, but it's a statement of appreciation uh, about each of you being here. Because in, 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 and I'm talking to uh, you, Mr. Sharp, and, and you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Gaines, as well because these are gripping issues for everyone. Uh, but I come down on the side of just accept <laughs> what people's struggles are, and there's a lot of power in accepting, uh, in acceptance. But uh, I just want to ask you, Ms. Walker, if you want to say anything else about the just extraordinary uh, issues you had to go through as you uh, had this emerging sense of who you were that was not quite right with fit who you thought you were and wanted to be and were entitled to be. Uh, but that's not an easy decision to make to start walking down that road. You know, coming out, uh, like was said earlier by Dr. Lopez and Ms. Robinson, coming out is such a difficult process for so many LGBTQ people. And um, for me, I was lucky to be able to have such a supporting family and supportive um, uh, friends as well, um, and but that's not the case for so many other LGBTQ Americans. And uh, I came out in a time where, you know, trans people. This was before any of the anti-trans uh, legislation was being introduced, and it was still difficult for me. But I can't imagine trans kids that are coming out in this modern era of hate, uh, name calling, and violence by these state legislatures being called demons, groomers. Right everything like that, um, and, you know, me being called out by my state legislation and Alabama governor, who is elected to represent everybody in their state, everybody in their district, attacking those people for just simply being who they are is disgusting. And so having something like the Equality Act to protect those kids that don't have such a big support system and stop the yeah. um, incredibly violent rhetoric that is being introduced is incredibly important. Thank you very much. Dr. Lopez, I mean, you deal with kids, and whatever, <laughs> and we were all kids once, uh, but is some law that tells a child or a young teen, a uh, young adult, who they can or can't be uh, going to be persuasive to that person who's going through uh, some of the internal uh, struggles that uh, people go through to, uh, to fully realize their own identity with the law that imposes, uh, a, a, that prohibits them from uh, exploring who they want to be, have any chance of working versus acceptance? Um, I'm going to try to understand your question. Do you mean if with the laws that are being passed, gender affirming care, your question is, are those were there chances of those children? Well, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to. Uh, I didn't ask that very well, but I'm out of time, and I'm going to yield back. Thank you very much. I thank you, Senator Welsh, and uh, I have to go vote on a roll call that's about to come to an end. So I'm going to have to bring this to a close at this. But I want to say two or three things, uh, having sat through the entire hearing and listened to all the questions. Uh, we ended up with three issues here. The first issue was violence, and I hope we can all agree and nod. Violence is an unacceptable expression in a democracy. There are ways to express yourself through speech and press and voting and otherwise. Violence is unacceptable, whether it's at a San Francisco college or whether it's in the classrooms of high school in Alabama or whether it's the victims of LGBTQ hate crimes, which sadly are increasing. Unacceptable both sides of the table. 
That's one thing. The second thing is we have two issues that have emerged here. One is an issue with Ms. Walker. I was so uh, concerned about your coming here today, really. I didn't have to be. You're terrific. You really have poise and uh, make a presentation that is very powerful. It speaks well of you and certainly of your family that stood behind you while you made this difficult transition in life. But what we're talking about is the other Haley Walkers, in, Harley Walkers in the, across the United States and whether they will have the same opportunity for medical care, good professional medical care based on science and medicine, our state legislatures will step in and say, we don't want the family to make this decision. We'll make it for you. I think that's wrong. Uh, as I said at the outset, parents have a responsibility in life and death decision making. And I think what's clear is their basic misunderstanding about the care that's being given to gender affirmation. I think Dr. Lopez clarified that today, the notion that little kids are on the way to surgery or that medicines are being dispensed with abandon just doesn't bear uh, any credence when you look at the organizations that support the current method of uh, gender affirming care, American Medical Association, Academy of Pediatrics. And finally, Ms. Gaines, I get it. I understand why you feel as you do. You dedicated a big part of your life in an extraordinary way to a sport and something happened along the way which has seared your memory of that experience and leads you to speak out. But there's gotta be a way for us as Americans to enter into a conversation that doesn't protect your rights at the expense of uh, our witness from Alabama. There has to be a way that we can find that is respectful of transgender individuals uh, and respectful of what you have done with your life and, and the professionalism you brought to it. That's up to us on this side of the table, as I said earlier. Uh, I wasn't sure about this hearing, but I am sure now. I'm glad we had it. I'm glad you all had a chance to testify and answer the questions, and we had such a fulsome cooperation and, and participation by uh, all the members of the committee. We have the power to make the promise of equal justice under the law a reality. That's our job in the Senate Judiciary Committee and in the Senate. So let's use this power to protect everyone especially the LGBTQ families and our fundamental freedoms and our nation's future. And with that, the committee will stand adjourned.